Welcome to our NDSA Infrastructure Interest Group for December. Let me go ahead and um, post a link to the running notes doc. I think we may have a, a couple of other folks joining as well. Can everyone hear me okay, by the way? Great, all right, yeah, thanks, Michael. All right, let's wait another, maybe another minute. Um, while we're waiting, it would be great. It looks like folks have already started. If you could add your name to the attendance list uh, in the meeting notes. And if there's anyone who's here um, for the first meeting, uh, or this is your initial meeting, if you could put that under, put your name under the new attendees list, that would be wonderful as well. Um, let me go ahead and post this link one more time, just in case. Right. Well, we should, um, should probably get started. Um, if if you're open to it, um, if you're here for the first time, uh, it'd be great to hear a quick introduction um, and to introduce yourself to the rest of the, the um, group members on the call. Um, Heidi, I don't know if you'd be open to that. Sure. Hi, I'm Heidi Pettit. I'm a librarian and archivist at Loris College in Dubuque, Iowa. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Um, John or Mike? Sure, I'll yeah. go. I'm go ahead, sorry, John. Mike. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, I'm Sean Rounds. I'm the State Archivist and Director of Library and Archives at the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, I started at MHS back in 1998 as the first electronic records archivist here, and I'm kind of stepping back into the role um, with the departure of one of my staff members. So I'm I'm anxious to hear what's new in the field. <clears throat> Welcome. I'm Mike Gates. I'm a digital preservation technical specialist at the Harold B. Lee Library um, at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. I just came here a year ago and uh, I just came from about eight years of doing audiovisual uh, digitization. So just learning what I can. <laughs> great, great. Thanks for the intro. <clears throat> All right. Well, I think as um, as everyone's aware, um, this particular call uh, for the group is an open format call that we, we tend to call a, um, a solutions room and um, not just kind of um, high level terminology just came from uh, the DigiPrize conference uh, from NDSA a little while ago, um, where we gather to um, see if anybody would like to talk about a particular project that's happening at their organization and um, they're having any challenges with that project or would like some input from other members of the group. Um, we take some time to kind of brainstorm around that or provide feedback 
um, and get a conversation going that way. Um, in general, uh, you know, we have a few different forms of this meeting. Um, we have invited speakers in the past. Um, we have other folks who volunteered uh, to share information about an ongoing project. Um, and also this particular type of format. And then uh, one other format that we haven't done for a little while that would be interested in, interesting to do again is kind of a, a reading group format where we um, flag a couple of different um, studies or articles uh, publications to review as a group and we spend you know uh, a month or something um, taking a look at that and then we have an open conversation about it uh, when we get together. Um, so we'll be looking at probably doing that one for one of our meetings next year as well. Um, really quickly, just because we have the dates already for next year, um, I've list listed them here and um, so for 2024, the group will be getting together in March, June, September, December. Um, we also, uh, for December, we kind of moved that date in again to December 9th because um, uh, last year, for example, we had a, a meeting, you know, about a week before Christmas and it was difficult for folks to attend that or just there's a lot going on wrapping up for the year. So we decided to bring this meeting in a little bit, um, have it happen earlier. Uh, so. We'll do that again next year. Um, let's see. All right. So I'd like to go ahead and, I mean, I brought a couple of topics myself that I'm kind of interested in getting feedback on, but um, I would, I'd like to go ahead and open up the floor and see if anybody has anything in particular they'd like to, um, to discuss. And um, I will take some notes, um, but in, um, you know, just a reminder that the meeting is being recorded, so uh, we'll go ahead and post that recording to YouTube a little while after um, the meeting closes out as well. Um, so yeah, if, um, given that, is anybody interested in talking about a um, particular project or challenge that they're having at their organization? And um, feel free to add anything in the chat or um, raise your hand or whichever makes sense. Um, all right, well, I'd be happy to get us started um, with regard to, to something to chat about. Um, and it's definitely been uh, an interesting, kind of a, the, an interesting part of a project we're working on right now. So um, I'm at the California Digital Library and our repository Merit is actually um, a resource that can be used for digital preservation across the UC campuses. Um, the project we've been working on is um, involves a, actually an AWS resource um, that's it's a service that's been available for a while, but it's also based on um, what was openly available before as well, it still is called OpenSearch. Um, OpenSearch is actually um, a way to view the results of gathering a whole bunch of system information about your the microservices or your system that's running on an AWS platform. So um, just really, really briefly, the, um, the services that we run uh, do run on AWS EC2 instances, and um, there's, there are a bunch of them that make up the repositories, the repository as a whole. And we've been logging a lot of information in OpenSearch, um, which has been great. But we also have a separate database that um, that is that gathers information about all the content that's ingested into into the system. And so, 
that database, the inventory database, um, has file path information about every file that goes into the system. It has, um, you know, a it has it keeps track of all of the um, checksum information for all the files, uh, any of the metadata that metadata files that are there, any of the the kind of like object level metadata. It's all there, and. Um, we have wanted to make use of that somehow in terms of giving our depositors a way to look at the objects in their collection so um, they can see, for example, well, maybe there's a bit of like object level metadata that's missing in your in, in this object in this collection, but there could be hundreds of objects in that collection. So it's it's not practical to go through there and look at everything manually. Um, so what we're working on is actually a way to identify um you know or classify objects and you know re kind of introspect what's inside of a collection um and so that could mean okay particular objects all have sidecar metadata maybe we you know these are complex objects now that we we can flag them as complex objects that sort of thing um so the challenge though that's that's come up recently is that um our system uses Apache Tika to document MIME types. So we can keep track of how many TIFFs are in there, how many, you know, how many archival like formats that we consider good formats for obviously digital preservation purposes. Um, and we can and we we try to pay attention to you know the Library of Congress recommended format statement. Um, it's really up to, but it's really up to the campuses to you know, um, campus librarians and archivists to to determine what's best for them um, in terms of file formats. But because the repository has been around for so long, um, it's been about it's been about eleven years, not that long. But um, we have found that sometimes the MIME type of a file does not match the format extension that's on the file, and you know, it's a common problem um, and we're looking at ways to essentially iron out those details. Um, you know, in the past, we explored using Jove um, as a way to characterize uh, and validate content that's coming into the system. Um, this is before I got to CDL. Um, and then there, but in this case, we now have like a targeted group of files that we can identify that might have a file extension mismatch or might have an issue with the file format itself. Um, so, you know, Droid in the sense, the, you know, from the National Archives is, is um, one of the tools we're looking at. And, um, you know, using on, on a small scale, we could use it uh, to gain some additional information about all the different the files that we're concerned with. Um, but again, it's kind of like, that's a small scale operation. Um, and yeah, I guess my, my question is, um, you know, knowing that these tools can kind of kick out information that might be overlapping, sometimes it's a little conflicting. Um, I'm, you know, imagining folks who have used these tools before have kind of seen that the output can be, um, can be, if you use more than one, it can be a little redundant. Um, sometimes it's, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to interpret or it's very verbose, so you don't know what to focus on. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's just one of those things where I'm looking for ideas or tips around, you know, combinations of these tools to use, or if folks have had particularly experiences with them, um, especially Droid in this sense, um, and if they've been been very helpful, because what happens is mind types only get you so far. Um, Droid, for example, has you know support for for you know many many different file formats, um, as does Joe. But um, yeah, it's it's just been it's been an interesting project so far, and we're getting to that point where it'd be nice to get some feedback from uh, from other individuals who have used these tools to see what they've come across. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, so we've uh, implemented FITS 
It was a rapper, uh, Ram and Droid and J-Ho and Tika. And I think there's like seven tools now that are wrapped up in FITS. And um, we uh, create basically just a FITS metadata XML file that we put next to our objects that we're preserving. And um, yeah, as you noted, um, every tool describes it a bit differently. And <laughs> every tool thinks that things are are different. Even um, even TIFFs, which you'd think would be fairly straightforward. But once you start getting into different flavors of TIFF, like GeoTIFF and I don't know, this, that, and the other, we we ended up spending quite a bit of time fine tuning fits to exclude some tools for some kinds of files mm -hmm. and uh, boost the ranking of other tools for other kinds of files. Like XF tool, for example, is great on images, not so great on anything else. Jhove, as far as I can tell, is pretty awful for almost everything. And, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Yeah, Droid, <laughs> Droid is good. Um, our kind of takeaway that we walked away with is, okay, there is not going to be any consistent definitive answer about what this thing is. That So we're just going to take the best that we can get and we're going to document it in the XML file. And it's going to be basically descriptive metadata, you know, technical metadata. But before we take any actions based on the contents of that, probably need a human to actually go back and look at these things first and see what the different conflicting tools say. Uh, we're using um, that uh, uh, pronom also uh, to try and identify file formats. And pronom is changing like every 15 minutes. And so you'll find that mappings for a file will change over time um, as new pronoun identifiers are added and um, other ones get expanded. So it's basically a moving messy target is what we found. And we basically threw up our hands and thought, okay, it's all descriptive metadata and walked away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, have you found any particular use cases or cases where it's, you know, this process that you've implemented with all the different tools, is it, has it, you know, surfaced information that's been helpful um, in, in particular cases? Like for, or do you, do you tend to, you run it like on incoming, like new incoming content? Okay. Just, yeah, yeah we run it on new incoming content and we've just gone live with our preservation system so we haven't really had a chance to exercise any of this metadata except in terms of like theoretical use cases the um the main thing that we're looking at is like if we want to do format migrations in the uh, future and so we've built our system to have this dump of everything that fits puts out but then we choose, and we have a kind of complicated algorithm for determining that, we choose what will be the format or formats of record that we can query on when we decide we want to do a format migration in the future. Um, and at first we thought, well, let's pick one out of all of these, but even that ended up being complicated. So some for some of our files, we might have two or three formats recorded but we do kind of pick a subset and put it in a database separate from just the FITS output of what we think this file is. And we also put in a, um, a mechanism in our system where we can go ahead and say explicitly the MIME type and the pronoun type that we want to identify this file as. And that will always override whatever, whatever a tool says it is in terms of what we want it to be recorded as. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Interesting. It's just, yeah, part of, part of the, the goal that, you know, we're, we're after as well is, is to, you know, in, in addition to finding these kind of like mismatches or, or files that might have issues is, uh, you know, is that in the future, we'd like to be able to actively 
communicate to our depositors that you have, you know, particular file format that we might recommend migrating um, within a certain amount of time or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's definitely there's definitely a similar goal there, um, a common goal really. Um, so okay, well yeah, maybe um, maybe I could follow up with you a little bit afterwards um, to see. Um, just to, to get a couple of links from you or, or otherwise that'd be that'd be great yeah and i can give you like some uh, sample output that we're putting next to our preservation objects okay okay yeah yeah that'd be great thank you um i'm actually going to close a window shade really here because i'm pretty soon i'm going to have a massive amount of sun coming in i'll be right back Okay, sorry about that. All right, does um does anyone else have um something they'd like to to bring up? Bring up and get some feedback, feedback from. Hey Eric, this is this is Tyler from uh, Brigham Young University. I wanted to just chime in a little bit as well. Um, I've been a pretty big contributor to the Pronom Registry for the last few years, and. A lot of my work has been because of those mismatches that we find and and outliers that we find that we then try and understand why they're the way they are and then um, contribute back to pronoms so that it is a better identification system for us and for others. So it's I think that's an incredibly helpful to um, have that type of information available that others can learn from and. Um, I think we all have those same issues in our repositories with lots of mismatches and uh, uh, multiple identifiers for a single file. So um, it's all it's just a community of work we're trying to do to to make sense of it all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, is there, is is there, there, is there an echo, echo going, going on right now? Is that okay? Me? Let me. Okay, let me... Is that, is that still there? Try that now. Is that better? Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks, Tyler. Um, it that's you know we hadn't hadn't gotten to that step uh, yet. We we're thinking about contributing back um, to the registry. And um, so how do, how do you just, I'm not familiar, I mean, how do you actually do that? Is that uh, in the form of a um, data file of some sort or? Uh, you, can, you can do it as a simple request to, to the Pronom um, staff, or you can de uh, develop your own signature using their XML structure and submit that to them. Um, but here's a here's a I'll put a link in the chat that walks you through it, the whole process. And they have drop in calls every other Thursday. You can join in and ask questions, and it's they they really appreciate the community feedback. Okay, well, that's good to know. But I was I was also going to mention you you mentioned using Tika as your um, tool of choice currently. Um, I know there's a few people experimenting with a new um, addition to Tika where they've implemented Siegfried into Tika. So you get the you get some Siegfried data, which uses the pronom registry. Um, so you can get the MIME types and, and the Siegfried output with your Tika results. So that might be helpful in your situation. Right, right. Yeah. The um We've, we've used Tika exclusively just because of, I mean, that was originally implemented in, into the, the microservice that detects, you know, that handles the files. Um, and yeah, it could be, it could be really helpful to integrate additional, like get some inter additional information from Siegfried because um, particularly around formats that are classified by Tika, 
under the name of Octet Stream. Mm. Um, Octet Stream is like the all encompassing, <laughs> we know about it, but won't tell you anything more on the Tika side. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's like one of those, two, I was actually going to um, find a link from um, a site that's been incredibly helpful um, with formats. Let me see if I can. Here we go. Um, and go through. Okay. So this site, uh, they just dropped a link to in the chat. Um, I can pretty much switch over to Tika. There's a Tika choice there, and then the formats. It says 1,500 different formats. Um, but if I go to like. <clears throat> All of the, you know, searching through these lists um, and finding particular formats, um, you know, once I get to the octet stream format, um, you know, it's just really overwhelming mm -hmm. the number of different items that can be underneath there. Um, and I wanted to find a direct link to the, the overwhelming list, but I'm not finding it right at the moment. Um, um, let's um, see. Unfortunately, the official mime types is quite small. The IANA mime types don't cover a fraction of all the formats that are out there. They never bothered to submit them. So a lot of them will be generic ones. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and um, here is, yeah, I mean, it's, I think if you search this page for octet-stream, you'll see this list is just it looks like hundreds of different formats underneath of that classification, literally. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> that's when when we start when we first started working on this project, we're like, oh, look at this octet stream classification, and then oh, um, that's a big yeah, that, that's a an interesting discovery for sure. Um, Ellen, uh, thanks, Hillary. I uh, just posted this paper from. I think it's 2023, maybe helpful reference. Not well formed or invalid, now what? Towards a formalized workflow for format validation error treatment. Oh, by Nikki Lindley, okay. Thanks for posting that. Yeah, that was a great talk. This is um, this is one of those. Okay, yeah. Papers like these, we could we could select a few of them, and use as you know one of our basis for a uh, kind of a reading club meeting <laughs> approach. Mickey uses the same preservation system as us. It's the Ro Ex Libris Rosetta, which is built around the Pronom database, so or registry. So that's why we focus on it so much. Okay. And it has Jove built in as well, um, but there's like, like Scott said, lots of problems with, with Jove that need fixed. Yeah, I'm just starting to scan all over there. The front matter here. All right, this, I mean, I really appreciate all these references. This will be super helpful. Thank you. It's going to be very interesting to, to contribute back as well. So I should try to find some bandwidth for that. Um, All right, um, is there anything else folks want to mention? Either with regard to, to our project or their project or any new ideas. Um, I mean, it's, I don't want to take up too much time with uh, kind of like the, the project I've been discussing, so I'm going to kind of call it good there.
So I, I just um, as an aside, I saw a couple of folks in the chat who said they like the the reading club idea. Um, given we've got um, you know our meeting dates for next year already, um, if you know if people want to keep a, a watch for articles that they think would be very you know would be interesting for the group to review, um, definitely please please reach out to either Robin or myself. Um, with you know with links to those because um what we could do is we could gather a series of them and see who's interested in um reviewing which ones and you know as a group we'll we'll tackle a couple uh margaret yeah i completely agree um you know, even if we don't do a reading club, sharing articles that may be useful to folks would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Nicole. Um, yeah, no worries. Thanks for joining. Is that, you know, um, in a similar, similar vein, um, so, I imagine folks have probably seen the recent announcement uh, from Sybil Schaefer about the Climate Watch Working Group that um, NDSA would like to spin up or is spinning up. Um, so they're forming right now, but um, you know, major portion of major task for that group is initially to um, go through and review resources and articles and um, create bibliographies or reference links for anything that they find that they think is um, you know, directly applicable to, to preservation and climate change. Um, so we could we could definitely have a similar practice here and share articles. Um, we've done that a little bit, um, but it's certainly for the last couple of times we've done the the reading club or the reading club approach. So um, it was actually, I think those two articles came from. Um, Colleagues at Harvard were the couple couple of articles that we read, and um, they uh, they have been have been members of this group as well. So I did want to share, Eric, that um, for the number of people that were able to show up for the infrastructure interest group meeting at Digipres, and asking people about the formats both the invited speaker and the hot topic solution showcase, which would have been like, well, less like the group discussion, which we're having today, which came in third and the reading and discussion came in fourth, but nothing fell under at three. So it seems like the formats for the meeting seem to be working for us. But I think we need to share that with this broader interest group and everybody that's on the list and maybe get uh, more of an impression because they had our interest group meeting in the middle of lunch and a lot of people didn't know that it was going to happen. <laughs> and so we didn't get very many people. <laughs> yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. So we should we should reach back out. Yeah get some more some input from from folks um we could also we could also distribute like a quick uh like a doodle poll or something um mm -hmm. to the group to see what what people think i was really happy that people participated though um so we got six or seven answers on a couple of the questions okay Hey, um, Hillary, I see you got your hand up. Yeah, I have a um, problem that I'm working on. Um, if if you're done talking about meeting styles, Robin. Um, yeah, go for it. So this is super specific, but I'm about to go on an acquisitions trip, um, and the donor is really set on us um, on transferring specific iMessage conversations from their phone to the repository. And I'm curious if anyone has had any experience trying to like harvest specific iMessage threads because we're not getting the whole iPhone backup. And I've been trying to figure out ways to extract 
chat files and it's um, incredibly hard to not use a third party tool. So right now I've like purchased iMazing, which is a third party tool that's out of a company in Switzerland that seems to has pretty good like security features. But I was wondering if anyone else has come across this. And so your your primary concerns are just the security standpoint um, to, make, to make sure that what you're gaining from that phone or, or the yeah, what you're obtaining is not accidentally. Um, no, actually, it's just like how to get the iMessages out of the phone because we've like backed up, I've tested like, what if we backed up the whole iPhone, right? If you look at the backup files for an iPhone on a Mac, they're like purposely not human readable. It's like a crazy checksum listing of like right. every alphabet possible. Um, and then if you go into like the message app on a Mac, like, you know, you can message on your phone and also on your computer. Um, that if you wanted to export the whole thread, you would have to manually scroll to the very beginning of the chat and then export it as a PDF. But that doesn't guarantee that you would get the attachments. Interesting. <laughs> but Paul, you said something in the chat. You used a tool for GitHub for this. Was the tool able to extract specific iMessage conversations? Cool, thank you. And so what, what volume of data are you are you dealing with? This is, this is uh, a great question. <laughs> I don't know. It's a really um we haven't been able to get much information from the donor, but what I know is that they're a really prolific iMessage user. So I'm imagining the conversations are gonna be quite long. Okay. And then um, Tyler just posted a link as well. Oh, yes. Thank you. I've used this one before to convert. Yeah. But the trick with that one, for me at least, is that we were using, we already had access to the actual iMessage files from like a backup on an iPad. And so that was easy to pull. But I just think like current iOS standards, they're making it incredibly difficult to pull out those files. Yeah, Paul mentioned the tool he was using is called iMessage Exporter. <clears throat> and you might need to do this from a Mac uh, logged into iCloud. So is iMessage Exporter, um, is that also a tool that you've seen, um, Hillary? Yes, I have. Um but I was unsure how to actually run that against like an iPhone backup, but that makes sense to be logged into the iCloud. And uh, oh, there it is, okay. Yeah, thanks for the link, Tyler. And thanks for the, the reference, Paul. Yeah, I'll take a look at that again, thank you. Yeah, that challenge sounds very familiar. I'm trying to think of um, one of my colleagues at um, at a campus who reached out, just mentioned it. Like we have, you know, at, at UC we have. Um, oh, so Paul said I was able to do an HTML export that seems correct. Okay, that's good to hear. Yeah, I was just uh, just going to mention that um, across the campuses at UC, they they have um, just groups that meet uh, to exchange knowledge, and um, it's like a knowledge exchange kind of forum. And the same topic came up not so long ago. It feels like.
Okay, um, does um, anyone else have uh, something they'd like to grab uh, or gain some feedback on? one out there. Um, so we currently in the libraries are hosting the hardware for a preservation system. It's likely next year they're going to want us to move to the hardware that they're getting university-wide um, with a focus on research data storage mandates, but they want to fold our library's preservation into that as well, which has some benefits. They have a lot more money for one, but just wondered if anyone had experience using a university-wide system for preservation and if there's anything we should keep an eye out for. I would just say that it's been very difficult to get central IT to understand the difference between backup copies and preservation <laughs> and archiving. So um, I think that would be the only thing is not allowing them just to take the stuff and tell you that they're taking care of it, but to be involved in the discussion. Hey, Scott, you have a comment? Um, yeah, so our uh, preservation system um, uh, uses uh, the campus uh, storage and they set up um, uh, basically, for anybody who wants it, an S3 bucket, they're using an IBM COS uh, product, but they, it's S3 compliant. And so we use that as our primary uh, preservation storage. And we were able to work with the sysadmins and central IT, you know, to have it like um, write once, read many, versioning, lock, things like that. But then... Um, we also, uh, Mir is kind of a secondary storage up to uh, AWS uh, Glacier. And we have an educational contract with uh, AWS Glacier. So um, with all, with those two things in place, it's been fairly, um, you know, fairly cost, cost effective, hasn't been too expensive. The Glacier especially is very cheap, but we've taken care of, pretty much all the preservation stuff that we want. We just said to Central IT, we want bucket storage, S3 storage, and we'll take care of how long things stay there and all that kind of stuff ourselves. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, and I, I would also um, mention that um, as kind of an intermediate space um, to work to stage files, um, and to you know work with with individuals who need to send us files. Um, we've been using, in addition to S3 buckets as a place for storage or you know a similar kind of um, setup at, at other service providers. Um, we use ZFS. Um, so it is the reason I mentioned it is because, you can log on to, you know, an AWS server, like an EC2 instance, and it can have a ZFS storage attached to it. And it, it works, you know, like any other Linux command line kind of environment. It's a little easier to use that way versus S3, where there's, you know, a, um, a specific command line utility and, you know, there's a, a, all different, a completely different API. Um, so, from the stand, just from the standpoint of having a temporary area to work with files, um, ZFS storage has been useful to us too. Like before, we actually put something into to S3 or Glacier. I can see if I can try to find a link. Right. Um, this is...
All right, any other any other comments? Just had one little pitfall that to mention we we uh, have our library IT which uses our university storage locations for a lot of our preservation um, storage and because of a misunderstanding between preservation and and uh, general IT storage they uh, for a while kept our file stream separate from our metadata and we they had a storage migration and ended up losing some of the metadata so the file streams were kind of orphaned so just a little pitfall if you're working with it let them know how you want um, things backed up and <laughs> where things are stored and keeping things together so that your your aips are con contained as one object Let me just make sure I didn't say anything in the chat. Um, okay, there's another. Okay, there's, thanks, Paul, for posting that note. All right. Um, let's see. We're about uh, about twelve forty eight right now. So, um, does anybody else have anything to mention in terms of um, questions or comments? Um, Robin, did you want to mention anything else? Um, let me see if there's anything else on there. I don't think there's anything else in terms of the interest group meeting to share. So, okay. Um, hope everybody has a nice holiday. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I hope everyone has a nice holiday um, and get some some uh, downtime in to relax. Um, there's. I think the other the only other thing that comes to mind is that um, we tend to distribute a um, a link to gather topics ideas as well. Um, so we've had topics polls in the past. Um, I think we will be doing that again. So uh, Robin and I will send out a link to that um, in December, and then we'll have you know a bunch of time uh, to gather topics as well as um, you know, again, sharing articles sounds like a, a great idea um, to do regularly. So, um, but yeah, please uh, keep an eye out for that email um, with our topics poll. And if you all have um, particular topics you'd like to see covered in 2024, we'll um, see if we can focus on those. So, 